Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church here in Burlington, North Carolina on the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Ever loving God, your Son gives himself as living bread for the life of the world. Fill us with such a knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you continually. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Proverbs. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals, she has mixed her wine, she has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls, she calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In one of my favorite comic strips, Get Fuzzy, the main characters, a cat and a dog named Bucky and Satchel, have a bucket marked Stuff I Found, and the dog Satchel appears to have something in his mouth while the cat Bucky is keeping tally of food versus not food. They may be silly comic strip characters, but they are participating in an important reality. They are discerning what can or should be eaten and what should not. Nutritionally speaking, we focus a lot of time and energy on what things should or should not be eaten. Eggs are a good example. They were once good for you, then they were bad for you, then they were good for you again, and then we got tedious with it. The yolks are bad, but the whites are good. We developed the food pyramid of nutrition, which has now become the my plate pie chart of how much you should have of the different kinds of things. There's a lot of obsession about words like organic and all natural. If you spend any time on the internet, you are bombarded with advertisements. Need to lose weight? Here's five foods you should never eat. Want to improve your overall health and add years to your life? 
Here's the one superfood you should be eating every day. And there's even that joke that more or less does seem to be true that when you have certain health-related problems that require a strict diet that is sugar-free, fat-free, or carb-free, or what have you, and the doctor says, if you put something in your mouth and it tastes good, you've got to spit it out. See, all of that mania about food really does revolve around the question, should you eat that? And the questions, can you or should you eat that? And even possibly, how could I eat that? It's surely in the minds of the crowds gathered around Jesus in today's gospel text. At this point in John's gospel this summer, as we've heard over the last few Sundays, Jesus has called himself the bread of life and said that whoever eats this bread will neither hunger nor thirst. And we now pick up again this week where we left off last week. And folks in the crowd were already becoming confused and having doubts about this bread of life that they should be desiring and eating. But Jesus goes even further to say, the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. At this point, the response of the crowd can be anticipated, and it would be expected. What? Can you eat that? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Is this some kind of cannibalism? Jesus assures them, though, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Imagine being a group of first century Jews and hearing Jesus say something like this for the first time. I think we'd be confused and possibly even a good bit put off by this kind of talk. After all, the Jewish tradition taken from Scripture, there's a lot of laws about what one should eat and what one should not eat. And there is a particular prohibition against eating anything with its life still in it, which meant not to consume anything that still had blood in it. So when Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, one could hear that as problematic. But also, to eat flesh and drink blood was a metaphor for war, meaning that you were going to violently spill the blood of your enemies, utterly laying them to waste. So yes, Jesus saying that he gives his flesh and blood for food and drink seems to go against the laws about consuming blood as well as invoking this strange, awkward, even horrific imagery that is both brutal and gory. With our Christian ears, however, and having the benefit of the full witness of the Gospels, we know that we are speaking in Eucharistic language here. That is, the language concerning the sacrament of Holy Communion. And we recall how that meal of Holy Communion is, in fact, tied to the very bloody and gory event of Christ's crucifixion. And we recall how that saving act of his death and resurrection is our redemption and reconciliation to God. I'm always a bit hard on John's gospel account because it does not include in the Last Supper event an institution of the Eucharist, of Holy Communion. John seems to have been more interested in that foot washing and servanthood bit. Nevertheless, John seems to have the theology of Holy Communion down as it is very present 
in all of these bread of life texts throughout chapter 6 of his gospel. Obviously, then, this meal of Holy Communion was already a firm part of the early church's life. So should any good Christian convert wonder, why are we eating this meal? Or perhaps the question with which we began, should we eat this meal? John's Gospel gives a firm answer that it is the most important food that one will ever consume because this is the stuff of life. Again, Jesus says, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's why the terms flesh and blood are so important. They're the stuff of life. The Jewish law about not consuming blood had to do with the blood being life, and you were not to consume it with its life still in it. But that is essentially why we consume it when it comes to Jesus. This is the meal of life. In this case, it is the very life of Jesus with which we are fed. What we have on our altars in churches, it looks like bread and it looks like a cup of wine it tastes like bread and wine but with the word of the lord attached it is for us the true food and the true drink the body and blood of christ god invites us in this sacramental meal to participate in the divine life of christ our lord when we eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ, we participate in Christ himself. That's why in John's gospel, we hear Jesus saying to the church these things like, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. And also, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. But perhaps we wonder, as the Jews of John's gospel do, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, that's why we print in our bulletins on Sunday mornings here at St. Paul's a little paragraph concerning the meal of Holy Communion. And in that note, we acknowledge our lack of understanding about such things, saying we cannot pretend to understand how this can be that our Lord Jesus gives us his flesh to eat. But we trust only in the promises that he made. This is my body, this is my blood. It is the promise, the word attached to the bread and wine that makes the thing what Christ says it is. Martin Luther writes in the large catechism, it is true indeed that if you take the word away from the elements or view them apart from the word, you have nothing but ordinary bread and wine. But if the words remain as is right and necessary, then in virtue of them, they are truly the body and blood of Christ. For as we have it from the lips of Christ, so it is, for he cannot lie or deceive. So you see, it is not our understanding of how this can be, but it is simply our faith in Christ who proclaims the promise to us. Christ, who is the word of God, proclaims life to us in the partaking of his flesh in the midst of this world of death. So do we fully understand how such a thing can be? Of course not. It is a divine mystery. Does this business about consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus still sound strange and awkward to our ears, especially to those who might be newcomers to the faith? Surely it does. Should we consider this a superfood? Absolutely, considering what Jesus says it does for us. And per our original question again, should we eat this? 
Yes, always. Amen.